Hey, my friend, Adam here. Today, I wanted to share with you a bit of a thought process that I had and some of the notes that came out of it. See, I was listening to an interesting podcast this morning about success and achievement and performance and all of the things that go into building a successful business and becoming su success, blah, 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 becoming a successful speaker, uh, becoming a successful person, really trying to figure out sort of what are the clues and what are the paths that we can follow. And there were a couple interesting notes and, and golden nuggets there that I was able to take that I wanted to share with you. So I've never done this before, but I'm going to share with you some of my notes that I took and wrote down in my journal. Now, full disclosure, these are going to be a bit of a mess. So I'm going to do my best to either put some captions up or at least explain it clearly, kind of what we're talking about and what we're looking at here, rather than expecting you to try to decipher my writing. But it all starts up here in the upper right corner, which says you will be rewarded in direct proportion to the value that you provide. So this is something that I've heard say said for, for decades now, essentially, but I wanted to start off all of the rest of the flow with that main thought, because it really is true. It's like the reason that you get rewarded either monetarily or through feelings of satisfaction, uh, internal, external, whatever it is, it's pretty much always in direct relation to the amount of value, how much you're helping someone, how much you're making their lives or their business or their relationships or their health or whatever it is better than they were prior to having met you. Now there's caveats here, there's nuances, there's all kind of details, but that's what the rest of this is for. So let's, let's start with that fundamental belief, make sure that we're all on the same page here, and then we'll roll over here. So we'll track our arrow. Therefore, success is really about adding value. So success is achieved by adding value. Therefore, this is our fancy, um, fancy little therefore symbol. You need to be valuable. Now, I don't mean valuable as a person. You're amazing. You're awesome. People like you. You're, you're doing great. Uh, but when it comes to being rewarded monetarily, um, you're going to be rewarded again in direct proportion to the value you provide. So if you're not making that much money, it's simply because you are not providing that much valuable and therefore the focus needs to be on acquiring certain things that are going to make you more valuable as a business person, as a professional in your career, in whatever it is that you choose to do next. So you need to be valuable. You need to have something of value to offer. This should be one of those very common sense things, but you'd be amazed. Maybe it's a little bit of, um, of complaining or whining or self-pity, but uh, it probably wouldn't surprise you to hear that a lot of people think they should be more successful than they are, uh, when the reality is they just haven't found those, those keys, those triggers, those hook points to sort of drive them to the next level and really unleash their, their full value providing capability. So let's talk about value. Well, when it comes to value, you've got a couple different ways of doing this. Uh, there's a number of great books on the subject. There's a couple different frameworks. Um, Naval Ravikant has an amazing one where he talks about kind of four different ways of creating and delivering leverage being code and content and um, capital. What's the other one? Community. There's another one. Labor. I think it's labor. I try to put them all into uh, nice, nice, easy to remember acronyms. But regardless, essentially you can learn to code, but then you're going to need that skill. You can create content by delivering value and information and helping people. Uh, you can use labor by having other people help you. I labeled that as community, found it easier to remember. And of course you can use capital, which would be money. You can invest, you can reap the rewards of compound interest. You can do all of the things that you can do with money, but that often comes later and it often requires a more significant in a uh, lump sum in the early days in order to get rolling. So we're going to focus on skills primarily, but I still want to touch on this whole resources and knowledge experience thing. The first of which, when you're trying to become more successful or achieve anything of value, I'm waving this pen around like a crazy person, I'm going to get ink all over myself. When you're trying to provide value, you essentially have two things that you can invest. You can invest time or you can invest money. Now, when you're first getting started, you're going to have more time than money. So obviously you're going to focus there doing things that are unscalable, doing things that you're not going to be able to do for the rest of your life and the rest of your career, but you can do it now. So let's double down there. Over time though, as you start to accumulate more resources, more uh, financial means, more money, well, you can start to supplement some of the time with money. Good example of this is, um, this might make me sound bad, but, but bear with me. I don't donate my time to charity. And the reason I don't donate my time to charity is because my time is worth more than 
the amount of value they're going to get and I would be able to make a significantly bigger difference by donating money. So for easy math, let's say that an hour of my time is worth $5,000. Well, I can donate one hour of my time where somebody else can do the same amount of work that I can do in that time. And therefore I've basically robbed them of like $4,950 of value. Whereas I can go work on some other high leverage activity. I can consult for a large business, create a new marketing campaign, launch a new offer, et cetera, et cetera make that $5,000 and then just give it to them so they can do a whole lot more good. So this is where it's important to understand kind of the difference of time and money and what you have more of right now. Knowledge and experience, those are valuable because they allow you to look at a situation or a scenario objectively and really figure out, all right, well, what are the things that are going to make the biggest difference so you can focus in there? And then skills. This is what I want to talk about mostly and focus here because it's my opinion after having done this for a whole lot of years that where most people fall short is uh, is normally from a lack of skills and it's a lack of specific skills that they need to accomplish whatever goal that they have in mind. So it doesn't matter what goal you have, the reason you haven't achieved it yet is typically because you're, li uh, you're lacking some kind of fundamental skill in that area. Say you wanna become a world-class painter. I don't know, we'll go with that one. Well, it could be the reason you're not there yet is because you lack the skill in brushwork or shading or color theory or whatever else. These are all skills though, fortunately, that you can then learn and then you can apply them to become better at what you do. If it's business, it's typically a lack of skills in sales or in marketing or in um, value proposition design or in market research or in team building. Like there's all of these different puzzle pieces that we have to stack. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Now, to become quote unquote successful, whatever your definition of that means, the fastest path there is to focus on acquiring high value skills, skills that are essentially going to provide great Greater returns than others. Important to remember that not all skills, not all things are created equal. Some are simply going to deliver outsized returns, so you obviously want to focus there. So hence, this whole next messy section of it, let's talk about what a high value skill is first, then we'll talk about the path to go about acquiring these. So what is a high value skill? Essentially, a high value skill is something that is going to help someone solve a big, painful problem. So the greater the problem or the more people have it, the more that you're going to be rewarded, the more valuable the skill is. So I wrote down here, help a lot of people a little. So in other words, if you want to make a million dollars, you can help a million people with a $1 problem or help a few people a whole lot. Again, let's make that same million dollars. Well, you could help one person solve a million dollar problem and they will reward you accordingly. Typically, there's a few areas where people are going to be willing to pay and invest more in order to get the result. Those are health and wealth and relationships. So typically, if we can find a way to acquire skills in those areas, they will deliver outsized returns. Um, a high value skill is also one that takes advantage of your unique abilities. What are your, your interests, your experience, your, your natural talents? What are the things that other people ask you questions about? What are the things that you're really good at better than most people? The best high value skills are things that other people can't easily copy. And they're rarely one thing like coding or designing a website. It's usually a combination of a bunch of different skills all put together that make you just an absolute wizard in this one very specific area where you're able to deliver amazing results for people. Carrying on, next thing is this, um, this little Venn diagram down here. What you'll find is that your sweet spot for this is gonna be sort of this overlapping area of interests, things that you're interested in, things that you're passionate about, things that you care about, uh, skills like we already talked about. You obviously have to be good at whatever you're doing in order to be rewarded for it. Uh, and then of course, market demand. What are people out there willing to pay for? What is What are the big painful problems that the market has right now that you're gonna be able to go out and be able to solve? Good story here. Um, a, a awkward conversation I had with my kids the other day. They're they're really into art right now. We're getting them to do all these drawings and things like that. Uh, and they're also really into business and making money. So they're seven years old and five years old. Those are the two oldest ones. They're the one most, um, most capitalistic because they want to buy Lego and fun stuff like that. So they're trying to find ways to make money and they're thinking about doing this thing and that thing and the other thing. But one of their ideas was to sell their art. They're going to draw these pictures and then sell their art. The problem is not only do they have um, 
what's the what's the nice way to say this? Sort of a, a lack of understanding of the art world and, and what goes into it. But also, it was an awkward conversation explaining that the value that someone is willing to pay uh, is going to be based on all of the factors that go into it, all of the marketing and the perceived value and the, the artist and the skill, their brand and their reputation. And the fact is that as amazing as I think these drawings are, I think they're fantastic. They're simply not going to be able to charge $50, $5, $1, maybe 25 cents if, if someone's feeling nice and they want to support the kids or whatever it is. But it's because they're kind of lacking these different areas. Yes, they have an interest in it, but they're lacking skill and development because they're five and seven. Um, and there's most importantly, there's no market demand, at least not in this niche, in this area for child art of, of, this, uh, of this caliber and quality. Again, I think it's amazing, but art is a very subjective field. So again, this is the perfect example of why you've got to focus on finding that overlap between all of those. But let's move on. Whether we use the art example or building a business, whatever it is, we're going to have to learn and acquire these skills, these high value skills that are going to make the biggest difference for your life and for your business. Now, a couple important points. Skill acquisition. The path to becoming successful, hence the reason for success path or plan or formula at the top of the page. Learning and skill acquisition is not linear. People think that if I want to become good at whatever, I need to do this and then this and then this, I need to follow this perfect path. And it's understandable why people believe this. It's because this is how the education system has been run for ever, really. Uh, we start in kindergarten, we go to grade one and two and three and four and five. We learn our maths and our science and we learn our language and we, we do all of these things in a very linear progressive order. The problem with this, though, is that it allows you to retain the basics of information, uh, but everybody has this. This is not unique, it's not competitive, and you're not connecting dots in new and creative and innovative ways. Not to mention, you might go through 12 years of schooling, four years post-secondary, whatever it is, and come out the other end and be like, I don't even like this at all. And then you're looking back and, and looking at your entire educational career as a complete waste, which is sad and a bit of a disaster, especially because the way that you should be looking at learning is more of this circular path. You'll see that we've got kind of A to Z for our linear and we've got A to Z in this circular path here. Essentially, whatever it is that you want to do, you're starting out in the middle with uh, with few skills, few experience, whatever it is. We're all born the same way. We got we got nothing and we, we got to learn and grow from there. But every time you learn something new, it's going to move you one step further to the outside of the circle. You're not moving in a straight line. So you can learn this, then you can pivot and learn that. You can pivot and learn that. Uh, growing up, I used to be teased by my parents and, and friends, lovingly, lovingly, as, um, as uh, this flavor du jour, always having a different interest. There was all these things I was curious about and wanted to learn, whether it was science or art or sports or photography or whatever it was. I was always trying and learning something new. And at the time, they viewed this as uh, as a bit of a, not necessarily a weakness, but the, the sort of jack of all trades, master of none. What they failed to realize, however, is that fast forward now, decades later, it's by looking back through all of these different careers and all of these different skills and all of these different interests that have made me good at what I'm good at today. Essentially able to think creatively and innovatively and to draw from all of these completely random, uh, seemingly unrelated skills to put them together into what is my unique ability in order to build and grow and scale businesses thanks to all of this random seemingly random collection of experiences and everything in the past. So it's important to understand that everything you learn, every new experience, every step that you take is the right one. May not be the, the best, most optimal one, but taking a step is better than not taking a step at all. So do whatever you can to make sure that you're progressing forward. Next point, skills and learning, they compound over time. Now I wrote a note here. I'm going to read it for you because um, if I can even read my own writing, it says that learning compounds over time and with each new piece of information. So essentially, as you acquire new information, as you learn, as you go through all of these steps, the learning builds on itself and it really starts to accelerate because you're able to think more clearly and have a better foundation of the, the key things that you need to know in order to be successful. Let's use marketing as an example. When you first start marketing, it is this 
terrifyingly overwhelming diverse field. There's things you need to know like segmentation and positioning and differentiation and you need to know about value propositions and structures. When you first start a business, there's all these things that you have to learn very quickly about accounting and bookkeeping and taxes and fulfillment and delivery and optimization of your structure and, um, and team building and leadership, all these things. What ends up happening though is that as you start to collect bits of pieces of information, as you start to work with coaches or mentors or go through programs or courses or read books, whatever it is, all of this learning starts to build on each other and you realize that, hey, because I learned all this, learning this becomes easier and learning that becomes easier and it really starts to grow exponentially. Not only that, it takes me to the next point here, which is that it starts to connect all these previous learnings. So you can see my sketchy diagram here of all these connections, but essentially what these are is there's, they're different thoughts or ideas or, or brain patterns uh, that, that start to make these connections that you would have just been completely unable to make in the past. You're able to take an experience with say a difficult client and you're able to uh, to draw from a previous experience you had with a, a challenging conversation with a team member. And then you're able to draw from a sales training that you went through about how to remain calm and cool under fire. And then you're able to draw from a marketing course that you took and think about how to reframe and reposition this as not necessarily a problem, but an opportunity. And all of these things start to connect. And again, they compound and they just become stronger and stronger. So everything that you learn and everything that you do is absolutely worth it, not just now, but can pay off for weeks months, years, decades to come. Let's get to this one here. What is the fastest way to go about this? In my experience, as a lifelong learner, massive learning geek, I love learning stuff. I think it's unbelievably interesting to all the stuff that's out there. My only, um, one of my biggest regrets in life is that I'm not gonna live forever. So there's all these things that I wanna learn and do, and I've gotta be selective about which ones I choose to. But the fastest path by far is immersion. Essentially setting up your environment where you're surrounded, basically drowning in people and situations and scenarios that are exactly where you want to be and where you want your your, your goals to take you. So in other words, uh, they've done studies on this and like the fastest way to learn a language is to literally go to that country and then live in that country. You want to learn Spanish? Go anywhere. Latin America? Go to Spain. You want to learn French? Go to... Um, go to Quebec, go to France, want to learn Italian, go to Italy, and then stay there for like three months and talk as much as you can, be in the environment, look at things. At first, it's going to seem overwhelming and terrifying, and you might be a little hungry because you can't order the right kind of food, uh, but eventually you're going to get it, and you're going to get it a whole lot quicker. The same thing goes with business. Uh, if you want to be successful in business, one of the worst things that you can do is hang around your current circle of friends and family if they're not business owners. They, they're going to think different. They're going to act different. They're going to respond to risks and potential opportunities as different um, and not in the way that you're, that you're going to want to be operating in. So you need to find a way to surround yourself with people in places and with information and content that lines up with all the goals that you want to do. A couple other benefits here. Number one, standards and expectations. Like I said, if you're hanging around people that are not business owners and you want to become a more successful business owner, they're going to have a different standard and expectation than you do. There's this thing right now, um, I'm sure you've heard of it, it's called quiet quitting, where essentially it's like you show up to work and you do the bare minimum and you do nothing more than you're paid for and, um, and and that's it, which on the surface, I appreciate that sounds like a, a relatively logical argument. I mean, why would you go and, and put in all this extra effort for an organization that may or may not care about you and just to line their pockets, etc.? However, what you'll find is that this attitude, this belief is shared with precisely zero, zero of the, the world's top performing people. Not one of them ever does anything with like, what's the bare minimum I can do? How can I skate by? Uh, they have a different standard and a different expectation. That's why they're successful. They do more. They work harder. Um, even when the rewards aren't immediately recognizable, they know that they're building confidence and belief in themselves. They know that they're, even if they're not doing the work for, or they don't want to do the work just for that other person to, to get rich or whatever, they know that the benefit and the fulfillment they get by doing their best every time, that's what really matters. And they can take that with them everywhere and anywhere that they go next. Okay, next, exposure to ideas and new ways of thinking. Again, let's use the business example. If you're surrounded by people that are um, 
in the quiet quitting movement. They're, they're skating by, they're doing the bare minimum. That's going to be their mindset. How do I get by? What's the least I can do? How do I sort of just do whatever I need to do, etc.? Whereas if you surround yourself in an environment surrounded by people that you want to be like the successful people that you're viewing and modeling, they're going to introduce you to different ways of thinking. They're going to expand your mindset. They're going to, uh, to make you approach challenges and view them differently. They're going to change the way that you react to things that happen. They're going to essentially raise your tolerance for uncertainty and for risk and thereby sort of opening the door to all of the rewards that sit on the other side of that. So big, big important point here is that you need to make sure that you're immersing yourself with as many people in as many places with the best content as possible. On that note, I'm going to link up a video right here with some of my best marketing strategies and tips that I think is the logical next step to everything that we've just talked about here today. So if you're looking for even more, make sure to check that out now and uh, I'll see you in the next video.